for the round of introductions. It's, it's really useful, but also fascinating to see the diversity in the room, both geographically and also from your professional backgrounds, which, you know, frankly, is, should be at the heart also of diplomacy, people with different backgrounds. But first of all, thank you for inviting Australia to be part of this. We, most, we jumped at the opportunity <laughs> to be here. Um, to be with you, I mean, you are potentially the next generation of diplomats, the people that we'll be engaging with. So, of course, we want to be here and we want to talk with you. And I may, might I also congratulate you on the decision of being part of a course like this. Well, this is a choice you've made and, uh, and I think a very good one. Um, today I'll share some thoughts on Australia's foreign policy know, how we do it, how we, how we construct foreign policy, but also uh, you know, what it is, what is Australia's foreign policy objectives. But before I do that, let me quickly touch on Australia and Pakistan relations, which I know you said that I must uh, just a minute ago. Uh, you know, Australia and Pakistan have been friends and partners for many, many years, right from the very beginning. Uh, straight after partition, we established a resident mission here in, Paki in Pakistan in 1948. You know, since then, you know, our relationship has particularly been underpinned by very strong people-to-people -people links. And you can see an example in this small group here, we have some a graduate from the University of Wollongong. There are many, many thousands of graduates from the Australian universities. I think at any one time there's 14,000 Pakistanis in Australia studying. That builds on about 65,000 Pakistani Australians living in, in Australia. So it's a huge community in Australia, and it's a growing one, and it's one we very much welcome and we very much um, both benefit from. Um, and it also goes without saying that you know we have a lot of uh, a lot in common. Often people focus on differences, um, but when you look, you know, at any uh, relationship or at any um, you know, institutional linkage, but the more you look at uh, commonalities, um, the closer and closer uh, we become. We have a federal uh, government system. We both share the, 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 the opportunities and the challenges involved with a federal government system. Um, we have similar geoclimatic conditions. You know, the drought, uh, who is from Baluchistan? Someone over there. Yeah. The drought in Baluchistan, as well as in Sin is absolutely horrible. Um, but that's the sort of thing that Australia and Pakistan are talking about right now, is we suffer exactly the same sort of conditions, uh, and, 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 and including as it relates to agricultural challenges, water challenges, and you know, movement of people challenges. So, um, you know, in small town economies. Um, we also are fellow democracies, and we were so pleased to see um, you know, the, the, the second uh, transition of power of, uh, through uh, the electoral process last year here. Um, democracies aren't easy to maintain. They're not easy to, um, you know, to make the most of, but it was, it was a wonderful sight last year uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, that historic moment for Pakistan. We're both Commonwealth countries. And we're also, perhaps most importantly on the people-to-people -people level, we're, we're massive sports fanatics. And of course, your team will be coming to Australia in about three months' time in November. Sure. And I think we can still be friends through this process. <laughs> um, Australia and Pakistan work really closely together um, on a number of joint interests. Um, we jointly address security threats in the region. We jointly support regional peace in the region. We want to build economic prosperity, including by boosting bilateral trade and investment ties between Pakistan and Australia. And we also want to enhance the development for all Pakistanis. Australia has a development program here, like we do in many countries, and that is front and centre focused on improving the prosperity of Pakistanis. And of course, all of those things are part of Michelle and Mateen and my role here in Pakistan. It's not just you know, a line in a speech, that's what we do every day, trying to advance regional peace, trying to boost trade and investment ties, trying to understand um, the situation here. 
So, on to foreign policy and on to Australia's foreign policy. In our government, we have a tradition of using white papers. They're called white papers. Uh, in the areas of, particularly in foreign affairs and defence as it relates to this conversation. Um, these white papers set sort of medium term policy, you know, over a period of a decade or two. You know, and for defence planning it's of, often multiple decades. But these white papers are comprehensive documents that set out Australia's interests, the regional and global context, our objectives, our priorities, and our approaches, and in some cases the necessary resourcing to achieve all of those things, which is obviously a particular uh, issue when you're talking about capability and, and in, in spaces like security. The most recent foreign policy white paper for Australia was two years ago, almost two years ago now. And that was, that was the first one in 14 years, although there have been other similar papers. The process of drafting that document, how long do you think it took to draft a, a white paper which sets out our economic and uh, foreign policy and security outlook and policies? Is that a month? Sorry? Could be a month? Two months? <laughs> okay, well over a year. You know, somewhere between a year and, and, and two years. Uh, you know, the entire process. And what do you think is involved in that? How, how do you come up with a 50-page document that sets out your country's foreign policy objectives and priorities and context? What do you do? What do you think you would do to get the best possible white paper? Get feedback from embassies. Feedback from embassies. Embassies. Yeah. Our yeah, our own Australian embassies overseas. Absolutely. Missions abroad. Missions abroad. Missions abroad. Yeah. What else? Your own economic interests in the regions. Yes, understanding our own economic interests. What else would we need to do during that eighteen months? Okay. <laughs> Okay. First of all, we set up a dedicated task force in our foreign affairs department, but that includes people from all over government, defence people, police people, immigration people, all joining into a task force to, to do this um, you know, massive, massive task. Um, and <coughs> not only do they engage with all key government agencies in Australia on their global interests, but they also reach out domestically to Australian businesses, to Australian academics, to all sorts of local stakeholders. Why would we, why would we reach out domestically when we're talking about things overseas? Why would we do that? To find out how to best serve local interests by going global. Oh, this, this gentleman, come and join the High Commission. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. We're both in democracies. We both have voters. We both have taxpayers. I think Australia are a few more than Pakistan at the moment. Um, but these are the people we serve as public servants. And so they have a right to be engaged in this sort of policy process. And they also have a right to see the benefits and the value of that sort of... Um, that sort of long-term policy setting. What do most people think of diplomats? I mean, you, some of you, many of you want to be a diplomat. What do most people think of diplomats? They have a hard time coming to conclusions. <laughs> they have a hard time. <laughs> yes, that's because we're very empathetic people, and we, we hear both sides of the story. And sometimes it's difficult to come to a conclusion, but of course we must have an assessment. What, what, and what else? What are some of the other perceptions of diplomats? and foreign services. Yeah, it should be candid. It should, it should not talk about it. It should be candid. They act as a bridge between two countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they can be a bridge between two countries. But for what benefit? So for economic and cultural benefits. Okay, now we're getting closer. The reason we engage with the domestic audience is to be able to represent their interests overseas and bring them value. 
You know, we don't just have foreign services for the fun of it. There has to be a national interest. There has to be a local benefit back in Australia. What might that look like? What might be a, a, a benefit from all the, you know, Pakistan's foreign and Australia's foreign service diplomats and all our efforts each year? What might be a benefit domestically? Financial, uh, uh, there are so many unlimited possibilities. Make a better picture of your country. You can uh, cope up. With the but for what benefit? It's it's wonderful. I, you know, we can spend millions, and Australia does spend millions, um, providing you know tourism Australia, giving a brand to Australia, and um, selling Australia overseas with lots of lovely cities and beautiful beaches. But for what benefit? Economically, could we we're looking for economic relief first of all, and make a strong economic. With our trading? Yeah, especially. absolutely. Economic growth back in Australia. More jobs back in Australia. More high paying jobs back in Australia. More opportunities for businesses overseas. Better diplomatic relations with each other. But again, for what benefit? For what benefit to have. To portray a good image of your country. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It might be that you might have better regional relations. Pakistan might have better regional relations. I know it's quite topical. Uh, uh, for a number of reasons. What's some of them? If you're a diplomat working in Pakistan's foreign service, trying to improve relations with your neighboring countries, why would you do that? Better international standing. And what would that achieve? Better image of Pakistan internationally. Mm -hmm. For example, the issue right now we're facing in India. Yeah. It's not going to detail about it right now. But if we have better relations, better diplomacy with international uh, image, if we had that, it would have been a different stance right now. It would have been a different uh, situation right now. Mm. That would have been. Yeah. So for, for a number of business diplomats, you know, they, they pursue some interests. For example, they, they pursue their, their diploma of education, financial, you know, affordance of uh, conflict is misunderstanding. So there is a number of, you know, reasons that, you know, not only reasons, but core of objectives that diplomats work for. Mm. Yeah, okay, great answers. Mm -hmm. Who would approve it? Who would, who would? Representatives of their people. Yes, yes. So through the through the parliament, and who would that be? Same time, we will represent our culture and heritage to transfer to other countries, and uh, we will get back up tourism and other things. Yeah. So, so I'm talking about you know who ultimately signs off on Australia's foreign policy. It's our prime minister. You know, it's our foreign minister. It's our national security cabinet. It's the, it's the cabinet itself. It's really important, obviously, <coughs> to get um, complete buy-in, but also to the extent possible, even with political, other political opposition. You know, in Australia, uh, we try to have a, um, a, an approach to foreign policy where both sides, um, you know, particularly on national security, um, treat it as uh, bi bipartisan. So it's a really important issue. Uh, you know, you can have the best foreign policies, but if it's being undermined locally, then that makes it all the more difficult to achieve. So to a certain extent, within realism, um, there has to be outreach um, domestically and politically as well. Now, for our foreign policy white paper, what, is it? what, 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 what are all those things I mentioned? Let's start with context. So what is the regional and global context? And I would say Australia and Pakistan share the same region. You know, we view our region as the Indo-Pacific, of which Pakistan, of course, is part of, uh, part of that region. For us, the context is unprecedented change. I mean, the last 10, 15, 20, go back even a little bit longer, 30 years, has been incredible change. Not just technologically, but also you know, between um, major powers, uh, in the environment, all sorts of areas, there's been huge change. I think most people in Australia would assess that 
the environment is now actually harder. It's more complex. It's more interconnected, interdependent. And so that, for a, a diplomat, is wonderfully challenging, but also very difficult. Than perhaps, you know, you know, a few decades ago. And, it's, and those national, do you think national security threats remain the same? Or, or for Pakistan, do, is, is the same threats you face today the same as 10 years ago or 20 years ago? No, no, it keeps changing. They keep changing. They keep evolving with time. Okay, absolutely. So, you know, these things can be extremely diverse from long range missile threats for Australia, for example, um, which we worry very much about, the North Korean and the Korean Peninsula, um, to threats of terrorism, to uh, climate change, cyber warfare. cyber warfare. Okay, so the threats evolve, and things like demographic shifts can change balances of power and dynamics very easily too over time. But one thing that remains the same is your national interests, in the sense of what you're trying to uh, achieve and what your country stands for. We also think it's a far more contested and competitive world. We live in the most economically dynamic region in the world, in the Indo-Pacific, with all countries, including Pakistan, dealing with the growing power of China. By 2030, Asia will be home to 3.5 billion middle-class consumers. That's in 11 years. 3.5 billion middle-class consumers. So, you know, if you're not moving forward and adapting and, and looking for opportunities in the global context, in our regional context, you're probably going backwards. I think there's also challenges to globalization and the rules-based international order. And by that, I mean, you know, the systems and institutions that allow all countries to talk together and agree on rules and follow those rules. There's increasing protectionism in some parts. And I think certainly in some cases, some major powers are ignoring or undermining those international rules and laws. I think we'll see continued economic dynamism and, and growth in Asia, obviously, but also shifts in strategic power in our region and globally. So that's the context that Australia sees. So the next is, what is Australia's lens? What are our foundations upon building policy? We see these strategic changes and context through a very clear-eyed lens of opportunity and risk, as well as fierce competition. Make no mistake, countries are competing against each other. What are they competing for? What are countries competing for? Resources and influence. Resources? Influence. influence. What else? New markets. New markets. Excellent. What else are we competing for? Economic growth. Yeah, economic growth. How do you get that? Through investment, capital, talent. I mean, Australia has, as does many countries, you know, visa classes to get entrepreneurs to Australia and base there. You know, so we're competing all the time. Whilst we're friends, we're still competing. Our policies will continue to give expression to our values. This is a really important point. How does Pakistan determine its foreign policy? Well, one of the key ways Australia determines its foreign policy is on our values. What are Australian values? Give me one or two. I appreciate those that have been in Australia should be the first to answer. Uh, they, they call it bone show, bone low. Sorry? They, they, call, they call it a servo and a bone low. They put oh. all those inside. That's <laughs> the end of everything. Yeah, no, but what, what are our human values? If you were to think yeah. of a... Sorry? Culture. Yeah, respect for culture, absolutely. Respect for different cultures in Australia. What else? I think Australia would much focus on be uh, empathetic towards different nations. It shows how truly they care about other nations. 
Yeah. Most, mostly picture uh, I've seen the uh, interfaith and harmony. <laughs> interfaith and harmony, interfaith excellent. And, harmony. and earlier Sydney and Melbourne Gold Coast, everywhere, people are living so peaceful and Melbourne is the most peaceful city for living and absolutely the world most beautiful. Yeah, and, and also it's one of the most diverse, multi-ethnic cities in the world. And so it's not a choice for Australia about social cohesion and interfaith and all of these buzzwords. If we want to have a strong economy, a prosperous society, it's a must. What are the values? Freedom, equality, rule of law, mutual respect. These are the things that drive our foreign service in terms of policy setting. What are our assets in Australia? A strong and flexible, sorry? Sorry, land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got lots of it, but a bit like parts of Balochistan. You know, some of it's very difficult to, um, to, to grow on. Um, but yes, well, we, we have a, a big continent. Um, we have a strong and flexible economy. We have resilient institutions, innovative businesses, educated and a skilled population. Strong defence and nation national security capabilities. Secure borders, open society, resilient democratic institutions. So these are some of the strengths that we need to use to our advantage in foreign policy settings. You know, when we talk about Australia's economy, it has grown year on year for 26 years. I'm not sure there's any other country. I think we're the only country uh, that has done that in this time frame exceptionally strong economy which we're very you know, lucky and beneficial for as, as, um, as Australians. And our standard of living of course is one of the highest globally. So our, our outlook is global. We see ourselves as a regional power with global interests. A very important point. A regional power with global interests. We don't just end our interests in the Pacific or in Southeast Asia or in across the Indian Ocean. Our interests are global, as I mentioned order, uh, earlier. Things like the rules-based international order with global institutions are a core part of our foreign policy. So, what is our approach? We see a convergence of economic and security interests, those two threats and interests are coming together over the years. So we need to have our domestic and international policies working together to maximise our power and influence. Whole of government is a term Australia uses a lot in foreign policy. And that is making sure your defence force is with your foreign affairs services, with your police services, with your immigration, and you're all talking together to achieve one outcome. Often easier said than done. <laughs> And Australia has its challenges too. Um, soft power. I would be remiss doing this presentation if I were not to mention soft power. Okay, another tool for foreign policy. And those of you might, and those lucky enough to study in Australia, the precursor or the pre predecessor uh, of the current um, education uh, awards program we have was the Colombo Plan from the 1950s. Soft power has been going on for years and years in different ways and it will continue to evolve, but it should be a core part of any country's foreign policy tools. We want an active, determined and innovative diplomacy, including through strong partnerships globally. Australia cannot achieve all it wants to on its own. We need to have friends, we need to have partnerships, and we need alliances. Every country who's serious about foreign policy knows that that is a long-term significant investment to make in, in, in various areas and countries. We must take responsibility for our own security and prosperity while recognising we are stronger when sharing the burden of leadership with those friends and partners. Ultimately, we need to be sovereign and not reliant or influenced. 
and that includes making sure our decision making and institutions in Australia are free from foreign interference. It's also a part of foreign policy. So I'm getting towards the end and that leads to our foreign policy objectives for Australia. My wife checking on dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, <laughs> it is hard. She works very hard. She does. Way. And in fact, I'm having a work dinner tonight, <laughs> which is why she's calling the life of a diplomat. Um, so that leads to our foreign policy objectives. Here they are, five of them. Australia will work to keep our Indo-Pacific region peaceful and prosperous at a time of change. Australia will maximise opportunities for Australian businesses by keeping markets open and trade and investment flowing. Australia will ensure Australians remain safe, secure and free in the face of threats like terrorism. Australia will promote a world with fair rules and strong cooperation. And Australia will step up support for a more resilient Pacific, which is, of course, our, our, our closest area to Australia, with our own particular challenges. No long-term foreign policy goal is more important to Australia than working to keep our region, which is the Indo-Pacific, peaceful and prosperous. We're strengthening our alliance with the US and deepening relations with major regional democracies, including Indonesia and Japan. We're ambitious about engagement with China across a wide range of common interests. We're intensifying engagement with the countries of ASEAN, which I know you just had a presentation on, so that we remain a leading partner for Southeast Asia. Again, this is our neighbourhood. And that in, that's including through the various ASEAN summits and ASEAN forums. And we will use our aid program to help support stability and prosperity. We have a multi-billion dollar aid program globally. 500 million each year goes to humanitarian causes in our region, and including in Pakistan. So let me conclude by saying foreign policy is not a perfect science. It usually comes down to well thought out, considered policies and smart, talented people like yourselves. And a willingness to be both flexible and pragmatic to achieve outcomes, while also being rock hard on your principles and your values as a country. The role of a diplomat is to listen, engage, understand, report, negotiate, and ultimately to influence in your country's national interests. I'd encourage all of you to think about what are your strengths in that list of skill sets? What are the areas you want to work on? And for many diplomats, there's often a choice of being a geographic specialist, or being a thematic specialist, or being a generalist. And that's something that we all face in our careers with different, different opportunities and different um, disadvantages. But with that, I'll leave it at there and I'd be happy to take some questions if there's time. I'm sure I've spoken over time, but I'm uh, happy to take some questions.
China blaming or is there any something uh, fishy with a writer who is arrested in China? Okay, I'll come back to the second question, but your first question is very good. Um, you know, why is Australia part of this maritime security effort in the Straits of Hormuz? Really good question. And it goes to some of the points that I talked about. You know, what are Australia's, you know, we're a regional power with global interests. Some of our global interests include um, safe shipping lanes and safe lines of communication. For Australia, we, Im we import significant amounts of uh, resources and all through those straits. Much of our trade also depends on safe shipping routes. If we want a strong economy and a prosperous society, we also want to make sure that countries uh, follow the rules-based order and that there are also um, safety and security in critical regions relevant to Australia. So whilst it isn't geographically close, many would say it's geographically close to Australia, it's actually critical for our econo economy to ensure that there's, that, 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 there's safe, that there's security and stability in that region. So for that reason, we are joining that, uh, that task force or that group. I think Pakistan was also considering joining uh, as well. And I'm sure Pakistan has to make its own national interest questions, not just who is its uh, you know, closest friend, but what are our interests? How are we affected by uh, you know, s significant instability in that, in that part of the world, in the, in, in the Straits of Hormuz. How would Pakistan be affected? That's a question that your policy makers will be answering themselves. If there's significant, if there's an outbreak of conflict in that area, how will this affect Pakistan? And for us, it would have a significant effect on our economy. Of course, there's considerations about partners and alliances and all those things, but at the heart of it is our national interest. On the second question, I didn't quite uh, capture the, 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 the essence, but you said there was an arrest of an Australian yeah, in China. Right, uh, I think his young name is, he was arrested in China. Okay. So what do you say, what do you say about this, that why he's arrested is, was some... Okay, well it's very hard for me to comment on that, a case I'm not familiar with, which I apologize, but um, you know, in, in any case, in any country, um, you know, it's the role of foreign affairs to look out for their citizens. Yeah. It's called consul service, a key part of a diplomat's job. Again, this is one of those areas you can specialise in. So if somebody gets arrested in Pakistan, it's our job as diplomats to engage with that person and to engage with the government um, to determine the circumstances and you know, the appropriate assistance is being given uh, to that person. There's limits to how much we provide. And it obviously depends if they want our assistance. But in any case in the world, we would be making sure that we are um, you know, offering our consular services under what is called our consular services charter, reaching out to them and making sure that they're okay. If there's other issues at play, including um, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues around uh, you know, uh, illegal detention or otherwise, then that's another matter that diplomats would take up with a host country. Oh, I want some good ones, some more good ones. Please, what is Australia's take on the nuclear arsenal that Pakistan is developing? Do they have any person that? Between the nuclear arsenal, in the current, you talk about the comments in India. And well, there's multiple aspects, I guess, to that issue. The first is, is you know, the developments in Kashmir, of which you know Australia's long position has been one of neutrality, and you know we're friends with both sides, and we expect um, both sides to talk about this and have dialogue about it, you know, bilateral. Um, we also expect both sides to. Um, be restrained in the way that they act. I recognise that there's been comments on both sides which aren't necessarily helpful for um, you know, ongoing stability and ongoing um, peaceful efforts and ongoing dialogue. Um, as far as uh, you know, escalation, you know, this, is a, this is a serious, serious uh, you know, regional, uh, long-standing conflict between India and Pakistan. 
it's not, to nuclear powers um, that has you know, international repercussions as far as you know, nuclear, um, you know, when you talk about the nuclear side of it. So of course there's global interest and Australia's watching it really closely, um, but we would expect both sides to be restrained. One thing, uh, when I visited in the USA, that uh, Sikhs are very frequently doing their practices as a Sikh religion. And uh, same time, I wa watched uh, uh, some Hindu conflict coming to inside of a temple, and uh, they say, why are you coming in our temples in Gurdwaras? And the uh, Australian government did a very good decision that uh, no Hindu politician and politician takes in, in between the Gurdwaras. Mm -hmm. of a Sikh religion. Uh, did uh, um, Australian government uh, um, the support to a 2020? Or uh, because uh, I know that a lot of uh, people who were who working in uh, Australia, like uh, Sikh Supreme Council, mm -hmm. like uh, Sikh Martians, like uh, 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 Khalsa movement, mm -hmm. they're also working because uh, I've met too many people uh, from uh, Melbourne City Council. Mm -hmm in a very uh, street or uh, I think uh, in 2016. And what's your opinion about that? Uh, Punjabi are struggling for an uh, independent country for, uh, in uh, India. They want to a separation from uh, India. What's my opinion about um, the struggle within Punjab in yep. India? Yes. Yep. For those that want but to separate. Mostly they, are work, uh, they are living in uh, Australia, especially they are living yep. in Canada. Both countries are end of the world. Yeah. And they are very happy. And they are saying this, this is our homeland now. Yeah. Here, yeah, one in Australia, second one is Canada. Okay. Well, I, I, I must admit, I, I'm not across all the details of, uh, of you know, the situation in Punjab in India as far as uh, the demands and, and desires of, of various um, groups. But, I mean, Australia's, you know, the fundamental issue here is that Australia welcomes people from all over the world. They welcome people with different views. They welcome people from different ethnic backgrounds. They welcome people who come from war-torn areas or from areas of fragility, and we want them to be part of our society. Yeah, you know, and that's that's because, what we stand because for. Because I received four gold medals from Australia <laughs> by Sikh community. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, you know, and the Sikh community is a big part of the Australian community and a growing one. Um, They're doing a work hard, hard for progress in uh, Melbourne, Sydney, and I've seen the hotels and. Uh, uh, especially on uh, ships, on uh, um, crews, everywhere they are working there. Mm. So, any more questions? So, so one of the interesting things that you were, you were saying is that you, uh, you publish or you, are, you know, uh, develop a white paper. So, it's been 14 years that you took and you for the, for the another one. Mm. So, how you decide that, yes, this is a trend that we need a white paper? Is it like, uh, you have fundamental these objectives that are there always, and then you build on. It's like every certain period that you define that white paper, because this is very interesting for a country to have, you know, a certain period of time you issue a white paper and you tell the world that this is our mm -hmm. foreign policy objectives and these have been evolved. So, uh, I mean, this is very interesting to know that how these decided at, at the policy level that yes, we need a white paper. Mm. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, but in the interest of the person yeah. because it's something very different. Yeah, and there's no set format. I mean, you know, you don't just do a white paper every five years or you know, every ten years. It will depend on the circumstances and it will depend on, uh, you know, if the last one is frankly if it's no longer relevant or if there are massive problems or gaps. Um, it will also depend on how the circumstances globally, regionally have changed. So 14 years, you're right, is a long time. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, in Australia, another document that was done by, uh, called the Asian Century White Paper, or Asian Century Paper, um, which is very similar to a white paper. But, so there, 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 there have been intermittent documents. There's also been changes. Just, you know, the white paper isn't, isn't, isn't a permanent, um, you know, non-changeable thing. You know, we acknowledge that the sort of, you know, every year it's basically, you know, it's, sort of, it's not updated the document itself, but policies and, and approaches are updated. Depending on the circumstances. Is it like the white paper is produced? It's not like similar to what we have. And the change of the government is the change of, yes, the basics is the same, mm. but change of the government is given the 
you give the certain dimension of your foreign policy. Yeah. Is it happening again in Australia? I mean, the white paper. I, I yeah, no, that's, a, white that's a fair paper. point. Plus, uh, uh, of the this change of the government also influences that issuing of the white yeah. paper. I mean, 14 years is, is a huge gap. Yeah, and of course, I think uh, 14 years takes us back to uh, the same government in Australia, the coalition government. Uh, and so uh, uh, was, the one in between was by a Labour government. Um, but your point is right. Yes, it can be tied to political circumstances and to, um, you know, a new government gets in and they want to reset the agenda or, you know, um, you know review uh, uh, approaches. So. Uh, it would it would be completely um, plausible that should there be a change of government in the future in Australia, that a new government might want to do another white paper, likewise on defence, if they, particularly if they have a different policy approach. You know, obviously, different parties have different policies. Um, you know, and if the old white paper is not appropriate, then uh, new white papers uh, you know, will be will be called for. Um, defence tend to do white papers a lot more often than foreign affairs. I think it's probably every five years. Um, on average. Yeah, and second and uh, most important thing is that in the, in the international system and international world, I mean, globally we are facing this immigration problems. Um, we have seen it as a, on the north, uh, many many of the issues in the north especially. Um, how does uh, Australia see that uh, immigration problems? For example, a lot of conflicts going on and the people are you know, burning their boats to reach to Australia. So what is the immigration policy? Are you diversifying it? Uh, you are you know, changing it and how you are flexibility, bringing it a flexibility in it? Or how you view that? I mean, in the conflict situations where countries like Syria or Pakistan or uh, around the world, and the industry is flowing really. So mm -hmm. how you, how Australia is viewing that this whole scenario in crisis? Because I've seen uh, uh, for the past 10 years that there's a lot of movement to towards the prosperous regions, including Australia, and by people who are, who are using illegal means, of course, and then, I mean, there are crises uh, which, are, which are really happening. So, I mean, Australia's take on the immigration issue in the global level. Mm. Well, as I said earlier, our core foreign policy priority is maintaining regional peace and prosperity, the growth. Um, you know, and that directly relates to conflicts, instability, droughts, humanitarian. You know, all of those things can lead to movement of people. Uh, I've long worked in develop on development humanitarian issues, and you you go to communities; they always want to stay where they are. Fundamentally, that's their home. People want to stay where their homes are. Um, it's usually some forces that the, you know, environmental or other or security or otherwise that are making them to, you know, to leave. Um, and so that's never a good outcome. It's not what people want. Um, you know, Australia's interest is doing our very best in the first instance to avoid the movement of people. You know, we work very closely on fragile countries and, and you know, on conflict issues and preventing conflict, preventing um, you know, humanitarian disasters, making societies more resilient. So that's the first point. Prevention is essential. The second point is if there is movement of people, I mean, you know, Australia's interest is making sure that that happens in the most compassionate and the most, um, you know, uh, um, the, the, the most systematic way that's, that's, that's possible to reduce suffering. Um, and often that means, um, you know, Pakistan in particular is one of the is has longest been one of the biggest hosts of refugee population here. So I mean, you know better than anyone about the complications of hosting um, refugee populations. Uh, and we acknowledge that. I mean, it, it's been an incredible service to the global common good by um, Pakistan's uh, investment in refugees over many, many decades. Um, and then your third point, and, and so Australia supports all sorts of um, uh, initiatives in third countries to reduce that suffering and to help refugees get back to their homeland. The third category that you mentioned is those that are being moved illegally around the world uh, to uh, gain access to countries, um, often in, you know, with hor horrific and, uh, stories of their own uh, in terms of suffering. You know, Australia's policy is that we, um, you know, we focus and support a organized 
migration process into Australia through UNHCR. I think something like 20,000 a year come into Australia, refugees, which I think puts us about third in the world on intake of refugees. We do also simultaneously do our best to reduce the likelihood of criminals and people smugglers trying to put people on dangerous boats, dying at sea to get to Australia. That we are against. Thank you so much, Excellency Grand for a round of applause for us. <laughs> we are honored that you have given your precious time. I know that's very, very important. You are doing a lot of business, I mean, good business for not only for but your own country, but for a And we have been meeting you over here in this You are our ambassador in the embassy. Thank you so much for your kindness. Uh, but Insab is one of the examples of sitting in the embassy as Pakistani as a diplomat, right? So congratulations for your wonderful work. You are, you are, of course, you are an admin and a uh, foreign master within your embassy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barak. Um, round of applause again for all the new people.